On Stage is brought to you in part by Bellevue Music Festival featuring Dexter Daps, Saturday, May 14 in Orlando, Florida. For tickets and info, visit their Instagram at Bellevue Music Fest. Since Soja won the award for best reggae album of 2021, many in the Jamaican space have been asking this question, who is Soja? On our stage this week, everything you need to know about the group, including the question of acts like them having an advantage in the music. The World Boss's former manager, Ron Butler, throws quite a party in Atlanta for his 50th birthday. A story outside the scope of what we do here on stage. Two young ladies in their 20s facing incredible hurdles to get customers for their noble initiative. You want to see this story? Jamaica Reggae Industry Association, Jaria, honors 31. All coming up right here on our stage. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Winford Williams. We'll be right back. On Stage with Winford Williams. On Stage is brought to you in part by Bellevue Music Festival featuring Dexter Daps, Saturday, May 14 in Orlando, Florida. For tickets and info, visit their Instagram at Bellevue Music Fest. And we're back now with Top Stories. <laughs> to Jamaica from the Love and Harmony Cruise, we took the opportunity to make good our affirmative RSVP for Ron Butler's 50th birthday celebration. Saturday, April 9, in Atlanta, Georgia. The man who was the first official manager for Vibes Cartel during the formative years of the artist's career. <laughs> Brought friends and associates from all over the Jamaican space for the dance hall style celebration, including these classmates from his Jamaican high school, St. Catherine High. I'm Camille, I'm from Atlanta, and I just want to make Wish Butler a very happy birthday. I just want to wish Butler a happy 50th birthday and all the best. I would like to wish Ron a happy 50th birthday. We're, so, we're here for you, Ron. Party. You don't know, right. cause you are not you know, and I mean I'm King Lincoln. Yeah. When the ladies they know me, that's why they crown me. No fish, that's up. Yeah, yeah, it's on stage, it's a grand stage, it's a party, and we are here partying. Okay, enough. listen to the party nice enough. Sorry. Blessings, big up and blessings to Butler, cause I really out. Really Look out for bigger really and better. Happy birthday to the big, 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 big Dan General 50th birthday, Mercedes. With music by Stone Love, Peter Blacks, Mark Dragon, and Bugsy Bam Bam, the high point of the night was this the man of the moment, drenched in champagne. It's a joy and a great look. Fly from Jamaica. You have to come celebrate with me. Alright, I'm going to show from Chapel here. Yeah, make them know. Okay, this time up, baby. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Real, real friend. But like, big up yourself for your birthday. You're a real, real man. And you deserve all of the greatness that is to come. Big up yourself for your birthday. On stage, you know it's the right stage, right? 50 is a very special number in your life. 
time because half a century. So it's a milestone. And it's not many people live to see it. So the fact that I am here, I lost two friends last year. One died the night before his 50th. And one died a week before. Guys I used to go to school with. So even the last week leading up to this party, that keep reflecting in my head. But thank be to God I'm here. You now we are now on the 10th of April. So the 9th already passed. So I'm 50 plus right now. Thank you very much, Winford, on stage. Thank all of Atlanta, all of my St. Catherine High School friends that turn out like 25. I haven't seen them in over 30 years. And they came, they fly from England, Jamaica, all in America here. Appreciate them. All of the Atlanta Georgia people who've been supporting me. I thank them very much. And you don't know, it's a great job. This is not normally what we do here on stage, but I'm asking for your attention to this story. Two young ladies in their 20s who are good at farming, commercial farming, but face significant hurdles getting businesses to purchase their produce. Can you believe it? This is their story. All right, so go ahead now and start with your names. Hello, my name is Kishana Armstrong and I am the co-founder of Believe Farms Limited. I am Sudina Milton and I am the founder of Believe Farms Limited. We started Believe Farms our own um, a year and six months going on. We have eight acres of land. In Clarendon and also in St. Thomas. Mm -hmm. And we farm okras, sweet potatoes, we have papaya right now. Um, we do pumpkin. We're also working on getting into, um, starting our greenhouse operation. However, we are having difficulties in getting um, getting into hotels, into supermarkets, and so forth. It's like they it's, mark. It's basically yeah. connections run Jamaica. Like we're currently in a hotel in Monte in Orchard in Runaway Bay. We're in um, a, a very prominent supermarket. But even when you're trying to go to the, the different branches of that same supermarket, because you're only in three branches, right? But when you're trying to go to like the different branches, it's like you still have to know somebody to get in. You can't just say, okay, I am on the system. I'm giving you a good price. Because a lot of the time our prices are better and our quality, quality is better than, than, than what is in there. But it's a link thing. You have to know somebody or some powerful man a supply the supermarket and as a result even if him crops is sh shitty him still have to get the orders right and you and you already on the system and you already giving a bit of price same with the hotel now we, we send out a pick we send out um these other other super um hotels it turns out that for the hotel now you it, it's hard to get through to the purchasing manager even when you call it's hard to get into them and the second thing, when you finally get through to them, is another links thing again. Mm -hmm. That you don't know if somebody giving somebody a thing to um, to make them accept accept it, which we hear about it, because we, we you understand we, we swear a small, it's gone. yeah we, we swear a small play, player in it, and it's just difficult. And a lot of the time, our prices are quality. Right now, what we supply to the hotel that we deliver, our sweet potatoes, our okra or peppers is better quality than the bigger place that has been doing it for a long time. You understand? But even December gone, we're supposed to get majority of the, uh, the sweet potato um, POs. And it turns out that it was December, we didn't get it. We get less than, we, you know, less than it. But when it's slow, that's when we get majority of the orders. Yes. So we, we kind of frustrated and we kind of feel like, you know, we, we, we're not connected the right way in, um, in what we're doing and we're just seeking help. It's like we're working hard, but then it's like we're not getting the chance to really... To prove ourselves. Yeah. To prove ourselves. Okay. You you live where? We live at Kingston. We live in Kingston. And you're farming in, in what parish? St. Thomas. And Clarina. And Clarina. Yes. So Ebony Agro Park and then planting Garden Agro Park. So we have eight acres. Okay, so what made you choose farming? farming. Mm -hmm. Well, to be honest, um, it was really my idea. Um, what happened now, around 19, I was more interested in cattle farming. 
right? But how I want to do cattle farming and just animals overall, it takes a lot of money. So we have to look at the nearest hanging fruit. And the nearest and the cheapest hanging fruit was crops, yes. right? And when I started to do research, I wanted to do greenhouse farming because I'm more into the greenhouse crops to be honest, more money and all of that. But also, we don't produce a lot of it, we have to be importing a lot of it. And when I started to do the research on what, what crops to do, I realized that we basically import too much things like we crop. We import like a billion dollar US worth of agricultural produce. So I was like, whoa, Jamaica, whoa, PC, man. Like, I can, I need to do something to help my country. And, and that's how I came to her and I was telling her about it. And she, she's business um, minded as well. And she said, yes, we're going to do this together. We're going to do um, greenhouse farming. But it turns out that we didn't have the money for greenhouse. So we, we pivoted because how we started, we borrowed a loan, right? We borrowed a loan and I got the loan and we started and boy, it was expensive for the farm. Even to even get the lands, it was expensive. I have to do, um, to get the audited financial statement for three years, but all I was able to do that at 24 was because um, I had taxis while I was going to UTEC. How I ended up with the taxi, I used to go away overseas and work. I used to work 96 hours a, a, um, a week. And um, when I was 18, to buy my first taxi, and then I end up with the next one, you know, and I'd use that to send myself to school. Then I did Bad Dog, and she joined Bad Dog with me. And that's how I say, you know, I'm thinking, because uh, my whole plan was not to leave university and, um, and work for nobody. And then um, even at 21, I started a beekeeping business with three other young fellas. I kind of mash up like around 20. 2019 when we had that six week rain and I just we just departed ways with those young guys but at, right throughout that time I was always working and we just focused zero down on this because what we want to do with this now we want to not only export the these produce like the sweet potato and so on we want to do value added down the road and what we want to contribute um to our economy and it will help get into manufacturing, export and it will help the youths um, in the sense of you know family it's not just uh, you know a dirty work it you know we have good because every time what we drive we have a truck and we drive them and we say you know you're the prettiest farmer girl you know you sure you do farming you know look you know, look like a farmer so I'm saying you know what's our farmer supposed to look like and if it's so uneducated you sure you're a farmer you know stuff like that so um we just want to change how people view farmers because it's really a stereotype because I've met so much farmers that you would not believe that they are farmers. You know, they have big vehicle and you know, have good jobs, but they do farming part time and they have acres of land, you know, but people just don't think that they're farmers. It, it can be profitable if, well, again, if you're connected to Yes. So, so, so you, you've come up, you guys, you, you, you've used your own initiative yeah. to do this and you've had struggles, you've had hurdles that you had to go over right but the biggest hurdle is for distributors for for businesses to let you in to even hear you yes, and, to, and to hear what you have we're trying to get into price mark yeah. oh my god we got we, we end up meet the the manager for price mark and he said send it information to the purchasing lady purchasing. and we did which we sent our three different occasions and she didn't even respond she didn't even respond i said receive but not interested not even respond so it was it's difficult and we know that we as i said we we, we, we can rival the prices and we rival the quality okay. in those places we so really want to get into that new price mart in portmore but okay. then again we're saying how we go about it is it that we have to go back to this, the same group of persons for kingston or is there somebody different for portmore so we're reaching out to you we're reaching out to you yes well my dear you I, I think you've made your case. I am, you were in tears earlier. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't, I didn't pull tears in this interview, <laughs> but you were in tears about this. You know what I mean? It and, comes out frustrating. And the frustration, I totally understand it. Yeah. Let's see how people respond to this. This, I'm, I am, I can assure you that Jamaicans will respond 
positively to all it, to both of you. And a lot of people will be surprised. Okay, I think we, I'm surprised. <laughs> and I'm not living on a rock. I am very surprised that this is happening in Jamaica. So let's see what happens when we put this out. Cause we're going to put it out, okay? Thank all right. you. All right, all right, ladies. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you for talking to me. <laughs> all right. Bless you. The Jamaica Reggae Industry Association, Jaria, on Sunday, April 17, revealed its 2022 list of honorees for outstanding achievements in and contributions to the genre throughout 2021. 31 awardees in various categories, including Song of the Year presented to Yaxta for his song Ambition and Breakthrough Artist of the Year presented to Joby J. Also among the awardees was our very own Winford Williams, who was awarded for Extraordinary Impact on the Reggae Industry. Reggae Industry Association is pleased to recognize Winford Williams for his Extraordinary Impact on the Reggae Industry. The Jaria Honors Awards was streamed on various platforms across the world. All right, so congratulations to all the Jaria honorees, including yours truly. Okay, thanks again, Jaria. And still to come right here on our stage, who is Soja, the American reggae group who just won Best Reggae Album of 2021? On Stage is brought to you in part by Bellevue Music Festival featuring Dexter Daps, Saturday, May 14 in Orlando, Florida. For tickets and info, visit their Instagram at Bellevue Music Fest. Welcome back. Since Soja won the Grammy Award for Best Reggae Album of 2021, many in the Jamaican space have been asking, who is Soja? Here now is everything you need to know about the group. While he was alive, such was Bob Marley's influence on reggae's global onslaught. Upon his passing in 1981, many feared Roots reggae would go into decline, and it did, but only in Jamaica. <laughs> the island's youth put the one drop sound on the back burner as a budding underground form that was later named Dancehall grabbed their full attention. But on the international scene, the Reggae King's phenomenal footprint continued to win millions of souls. Ladies and gentlemen, none of this would be possible if it wasn't for Bob Marley. Today, over three decades later, there would hardly be any opposition to the view that reggae is bigger and more popular than it was at the time of Marley's passing. But the more the music ascends, the more multi-ethnic its face becomes. The sun and the pyramid, long time connection, divine ancient ancestral foundation. Reggae stars of all races and creeds everywhere on the planet. From Africa to the Americas, Asia and the Pacific region to Europe. <laughs> causing some Jamaicans to fear losing the music to foreigners. Still, most Jamaicans agree that for reggae to sustain its place as a global force, it should not only be consumed, but also produced and performed by foreigners. Like this group out of Virginia, USA, known as Soja, performing live right now in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Formed in Arlington, Virginia in 1997, Soja started out as a typical band of teenagers playing the music they loved. But unlike the vast majority of their peers, the music they loved the most was far removed from the U.S. mainstream. This reggae music. Reggae. But I don't want to wait today. We're influenced by a lot of genres of music, like every genre of music growing up, you know? But when we heard Bob Marley for the first time, it, it changed it for us. I think reggae does a good job of representing all kinds of people. 
Before that, I listened to a lot of hip hop and a lot of rock, and I went through my phases musically with Bobby and with Bird, the drummer. But when we heard uh, this guy, Bob Marley, we were like, dude, this is bigger than music. This guy's reaching out and touching the world. He's the symbol of freedom everywhere. Okay. And so I think we fell in love with him, and that, that was kind of it after that. At least for me, I think that was it. So would you say you found reggae or reggae found you? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I guess a little of both. We uh, we found it, but the second we found it, it started revealing itself to us, and we we fell in love with it at that point. I think reggae found us. So was the band always reggae? Yes, I mean, it was from the, the very start. Yes, we took it very seriously. We would we would get on a train and we would go, you know, an hour away to a neighborhood where we didn't look like anybody else, and we would yes. walk all the way to the club. And you know, this is like 16 years old. And we'd be in there with a whole bunch of Jamaicans and a whole bunch of guys that, you know, we kind of stick out a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we went to every tour. We went to Sizzler Black Woman and Child, Sizzler Crazy Giant, Anthony B, so many things. Uh, Luciano Where There Is Life, Luciano Ja Messenger, just all the fattest stuff, all the exterminator stuff. And we were there for all of that. And um, I mean, we even, we go to the Bingy House every Saturday on mopeds, drive all the way across town to the neighborhood where we're not supposed to be and, and stay there till four o'clock in the morning and drive back. We were, we were serious. When I'm falling out, you know, they pull me back in. Back then, Soldier was a five-man aggregation with its leader, Jacob Hemphill, on lead vocals and guitar, Bob Jefferson on bass, Ryan Bertie on drums, Patrick O'Shea keyboards, and Ken Brownell percussion, each having additional responsibilities in the band. I'm the crew chief, they call me production, you know. Uh, I run a lot of the, the stage stuff, take care of that type of, those types of things, you know, the business on. You have to multitask, you can't be, you know, a successful band and musician in this time and not have, you know, different responsibilities. You gotta take care of, it's not just one thing that's gonna take care of it, but, you know. You gotta take care of many parts and everything else that you can that you can do for your band. It gets, it gets better every every time, you know, every show. The band later added a horn section, an alternate guitarist. Uh, I think it's the biggest thing that's ever happened to me, man. Maybe if I have a kid one day, that'll be a little bit bigger. But until now, that's the biggest thing ever. And hired Jamaican Sechika Soji Hamilton as their chief engineer. I met Soldier in Europe while touring with Gentleman. They were the support act for, um, on his tour. And they're listening to me every night, mixing for Gentleman. And they would come up to me and say, oh, you have that sound and like that. That's a type of sound that we need. That's a specific si um, type of sound. At the end of the tour, the manager walked over to me and said, so what are you doing when you go back to Jamaica? So I said, I'll be resting for a little while and then I'll go back home. And then he said, how about come working for us? I told him, okay, I'll come in and do a few shows for you. And the rest of it is, has been history. Yeah. <laughs> Four years now. Yeah. I haven't gone back to Germany on tour with Gentleman. And he's not, he's not worried about it. You know, he's... Happy for me. Today, 13 years and eight albums later, Soja is the leading reggae act in the US with millions of loyal fans around the globe and growing. South America, Europe, the United States, Pacific Islands, uh, Virginia, hopefully, we're, hopefully we're, Jamaica. We're are most of your fans. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 which of these? In Jamaica, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, South America, we headline big time festivals. Yes. So 60, 70,000 people will be the will be the the big band. Um, Hawaii, we we do the biggest venues there. United States, we do on the coast. We do gigantic venues. In the middle, a little bit smaller. Pacific Islands, Hawaii's been supporting us for 10 years. 10 years, man. Mm. We've done two, two or three music videos in Hawaii, plus a DVD. Hawaii's been doing us forever. Here in Puerto Rico, a population about the same size as Jamaica's. 
The band sold out this venue a week before the concert. Over 4,000 screaming fans. Puerto Rico's known about Soja for a long time. But they keep having us back and we keep feeling lucky to be here. So now, once a year, we come here and do a show. After the break, one-on-one -on -one with Soldier's leader, Jacob Hemphill, on everything from politics to religion, the environment to race, why he thinks Bob Marley is the greatest musical force in the world, and reggae is the future, all coming up right here on stage. On stage with Winford Williams. How long did it take you to get noticed? I mean, it depends on your definition of noticed. Am I noticed now? <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> oh, I, I suspect you're getting a lot of that now. Yeah, it took it took a long time. I mean, it's gonna take a lifetime. Yes. It's 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 never gonna stop. I'm never gonna turn around and say, okay, my music has reached enough people. I'm good. You know, we, we take breaks, but every time we come back, we're hungry for the same thing. I don't, I think getting noticed if a band's doing it the right way is like a, is like a slow angle going up. You don't really want to get noticed and then drop off. You want to kind of build, 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 build. Every tour, there's another couple hundred people. Every tour, there's a little bit bigger venue. Every album, you put a little bit more money into it. You bring someone else on the road, you bring a light man, you bring a, a sound man. Our sound man is Soul G. Hamilton uh, from, from Jamaica. He did all the, the big exterminator tours. You slowly bring in more musicians, you invest more of your time, you spend more time making the music, and 10 or 12 years later, you turn around and everywhere you play is sold out. What made you stay? What made you stick to it? You're musicians, you're youngsters. <laughs> Why didn't you go somewhere else? Why didn't you want to try some other genre? We, we always, I mean, I'm not gonna lie, when we're at band practice, we play whatever. <laughs> whatever Absolutely. the hot song is at mm. the time, yeah, we know how to play that. But reggae to us was bigger than, well, we grew up on reggae from the 70s, the 60s and the 70s, you know, and, and and then when Israel Vibration and Culture and Burning Spear and all that started coming, we listened to the 80s reggae. And then the 90s when Luciano and Sizzla and Anthony B were all doing it, that was what we listened to. But we always thought that mm -hmm. the point of reggae was to change the world. And we thought that was like bigger than music. And we just, whenever we would go play live, we wanted to put, we wanted to play reggae because we wanted to change the world. Okay. <laughs> Who are your listeners? Who are your fans? How would you define them? It's, it's everybody. I mean, I, we have a lot of, I think the way to look at it is, you know, things go in swings. Mm -hmm. You know, this is cool for a while, then that's cool. Now, if you look at the news now, what's cool is um, saving the earth that's dying, yes. saving the human race from killing each other over money, uh, human rights, mm -hmm. um, looking to the future. So that's kind of what we've been singing about for a long time. And I think nowadays what you hear on the radio is not very realistic. Mm -hmm. you know? And so what we're singing to connects with, with certain people. And I think whoever is concerned with what we're talking about um, or with the kind of music that we play, that, that becomes a Soja fan. I, I know you're doing, there are no limits to your topics, your, your subjects and so on. Roots and Lovers Rock are at the top of your your catalog, they're leading. Sure. Where is where are you most comfortable? I like I like doing an album that's about 70, 75 percent roots, which would be the main topics are environment, mm. humans, social system, political system, um, what's wrong with the world, and yeah. then about 25, 30 percent sad love songs. And that's what I've been doing <laughs> forever. Why sad? Why sad love songs? I like the sad love songs. I like when it's raining and the clouds are out. And I like the imagery and I like the feeling. And the, the happy love song with the sunshine is great. And, and mm -hmm. that's great. But for me, the kind of 
the love that, that sticks is the tough one, the one that everybody's got to fight for, and they, oh, they hold it for a while, then they drop it and break it, then they hold it for a while, then they drop it and break it, and then the chorus, they kind of mm -hmm. give you everything in a nutshell. Where are you now in relation to mainstream? Where would you say your band is at this point? I don't know. I kind of think mainstream is going to change soon. Okay. You know, if you look at rock and roll, you see it started as this grungy rock and roll, this dirty, you know, rock and music, and it gets bigger and bigger, and the more rich white guys put their hands on it, the worse it gets, you know, until it's wearing wigs and makeup and riding around in Lamborghinis with pools in the back, like Warrant and Skid Row, and singing about girls, 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 and cherry pie, and then somebody like Kurt Cobain in Nirvana comes along and puts mm -hmm. out an album like Nevermind. And overnight, all the excess, because rock is now making so much money and these guys are so rich, it disappears overnight. Nobody listens to that stuff. And I think it's about to happen to hip hop. You know, hip hop started in the street. It was the voice of the people. Hip hop's come so far from that. It used to be about who the smarter MC was, who could outword the other guy. Now it's more about kind of like who can put out the dumbest song, mm -hmm. <laughs> who can just repeat the same thing 15 times over a hot beat. And, and you sing about girls, and you sing about money, and you sing about um, you never have to work a day in your life, and you have a jet, and people can't relate to that. And somebody's gonna come out in hip hop, it might be this dude Macklemore, I don't know, but he's gonna put out a lot of songs people can relate to. And that's all we're trying to do, is make music that people can actually relate to. I'm quoting you now, reggae is the future. I Explain, think so. you I said think that. So. I think so, because reggae, reggae has never been number one as far as music genres go. It's never been number one. But reggae will never disappear either. Because as long as there's problems in this world, the people who don't have a voice in their political system, the people who don't have a voice in their community, even though they may be the majority, they need a voice. Mm -hmm. And reggae, at least the reggae I like, has always been that voice for the people. For poor people, for rich people, for black people, for white people, for every single person on this earth. I think reggae should be the voice for them like it was the voice for me and to me, that makes it the number one. That's my favorite genre. It's in a genre all by itself. It serves two purposes. It's music you can dance to, like all other music. And it's music that's trying to change the world. Quoting again, Bob Marley is the biggest musical force in the world. Absolutely. Uh, how do you reconcile that with the view that reggae is still young and it is the future? If Bob, is, was, the biggest musical force. Can reggae be bigger than Bob? And can it overtake what is now pop in the world? Sure. If I could show anybody in this hotel or anyone on the street a picture of Bob Marley and say, who is this, in any language, and they say, Bob Marley. And everywhere I go, I mean, he's a symbol of freedom. You see Bob Marley t-shirts everywhere. Bruce Lee is huge, but he's not as good as, or not a, sorry, not as good, but he's not as big as Bob Marley. Yes. You know, Jimi Hendrix is huge, but he's not as big as Bob Marley. Michael Jordan is huge, but he's not as big. Bob Marley had a way of speaking to everyone all at once. Everybody who listens to Bob thinks he's talking to them. I think that the reason Bob Marley was who he was is because of the uprising that was going on in the world during the 1970s. Yes. People were looking for change back then. It's not really like that anymore. People complain about the economy, but they still get all their products made overseas. People complain about uh, the president, but they still let the Congress make all his decisions for him. You know, people, mm -hmm. but in the 70s, people really want to change, and they would go out and they would try to change things. And I think it was the perfect bed for Bob Marley's lyrics to lay on, was this idea of social and political change for all the humans in the world. And the 60s and the 70s are kind of the first time people all kind of had that consciousness going. And I think we're headed for a much bigger one of those because um, the U.S. is locked in wars all around the world. And we've been in wars for, you know, decades now. And the people in the U.S. hate it, but we can't vote it out because all the guys with the money are already got their money and they're already spending the billions on, on war. We spend 51% of our, our tax on guns in the United States, 51%. Yes. That's a big pile of guns. Mm -hmm. and for a million reasons like this, the people don't have a voice anymore. We're not represented. And throughout history, if you look, I mean, you can go back 2,000 years. When the people aren't represented, they revolt. So I think we're heading for a bigger situation than what they had going on in the 60s and 70s. And I think that with that, 
reggae music and especially music or reggae music where what you're talking about is changing the world, not rehashing some message that someone else said 30 years ago that Bob Marley said or that Peter Tosh said or something. No, doing what they did, coming up and saying, we gotta change the world and this is how we're gonna do it. You know, the way Inner Circle would do it, the way Jacob Miller would do it, you know. And I think people are ready for that again. And I think that's why there could definitely be somebody bigger than well, I don't know if, see, I don't know if bigger than Bob Marley's a thing because I don't know if there's any musicians who are as good as him. But, but why, but, but that would explain why you feel reggae will be I think will reggae the future. Is, a, is a timely music and the worse the world gets, the more the world needs something like roots reggae, something that for those who say they that, feel is positive and moving oh, in the right direction. Okay, for those who say you are a liberal, and uh, these are just your liberal views that you're expressing now. Sure. You say? Uh, I'd say that, that there's, there's definitely uh, Republicans and Democrats and conservatives and liberals and all those things. But my, my main point is this. The earth gets hotter every year. Mm -hmm. That's the fact. If the earth gets too hot, stuff's not going to grow anymore. There's going to be a lot of bugs everywhere. And they're going to spread a lot of disease. The water's going to rise. The ice will melt. And our story will finish. Um, and it would be sad if our story finished because we kept racing for money. And that's what my music's about. You could be a conservative or a liberal, but the truth is, as long as we... See, what we did is we started, you know, thousands of years ago, I'm on my mountain, you're on your mountain, I see you, I think you're my enemy. Mm -hmm. But when we meet, we realize that we can get more done together than we can apart, which is take care of our families, find food and find shelter. Then they invent the written word, the family gets bigger. They invent religion, it gets bigger. They invent the nation, it gets bigger. Now you and anyone inside of Jamaica or Germany or United States or whatever, you help each other. But one day we're gonna come to the point where the country is the earth. The race is the humans. Yes. And everything we do is to make our race of human, you know, become what it truly is supposed to be instead of burning down everything for the sake of paper dollars. And that's, I don't think liber uh, conservative or liberal, I think that's just somebody who wants to see the human race. All right, keep it right here on stage. When we come back, Jacob responds to questions about white reggae acts taking over the music, religion, and more. On Stage is brought to you in part by Bellevue Music Festival featuring Dexter Daps, Saturday, May 14 in Orlando, Florida. For tickets and info, visit their Instagram at Bellevue Music Fest. And if you feel ashamed, maybe you should change this. While most Jamaicans welcome globalization of reggae, <laughs> some are concerned that uh, there's a takeover going on mm -hmm. with white groups, sure. white reggae acts. Sure. There's the emergence of so many acts well, in, there is. here in the US mm -hmm. and in Europe and other other cultures, other races, sure. Japanese and mm -hmm. so on. Sure. Um, where are you on that? How do you, what do you say to those who are concerned? Part of me agrees with them. I mean, I'll turn on satellite radio on a reggae station because I want to hear Jamaican reggae music, you know? And I turn it on and I hear me and then I hear another American band, and then I hear one Jamaican song, and then I hear another American band, and then I hear me again. And after a while, I start to understand <laughs> what they're saying. It's like, I want to hear some Jamaican reggae from a guy with a Jamaican accent singing about things that pertain to this. Um, but, you know, there's, there's nothing anybody can do about what the world needs. You know, what, what I sing about, I try to be as relevant as possible. And I think that a lot of um, what's coming out of Jamaica these days reminds Americans of American music. You hear about the rooms full of women, you hear about the piles of money, you hear about guns, you hear about... And people can't really relate to that. Now, you can pretend to relate to it, but honestly, if you got a room full of women, a pile of money, and a stack of guns, you're probably not listening to the radio right now. You're probably <laughs> off on your yacht somewhere or something. So, I think we're trying to make music that people relate to, and I think people are relating to it. Um, but things go in cycles. I mean, I look around and I see so many Jamaican bands that are coming up strong. You got Zinc Fence, you got Roots on the Ground, you got Rage and Fire, and you got really good artists out of Jamaica that, that people love. You know, I mean, the whole Marley family is, is huge, 
huge. Those guys put out quality record after quality record and people buy it and people go see them. But they're relating to people and they're, they're trying hard to do that. Like Snoop Lion, for instance, right? Some people like him, some people don't like him. This is a guy who's been singing about killing people, went to a guy who's singing about love and family and no guns allowed and, you know, herbs should be legalized. And that's a positive thing. And the other thing that's a positive thing is how much spotlight he's gonna bring to Jamaica. I mean, he's gonna bring a lot, a lot of spotlight. And um, those things are just setting up Jamaica to have a megastar come out. I mean, Damian Marley's a megastar. Mm -hmm. All the Marley's are megastars, but to have a megastar just come. When all eyes are on Jamaica, that's when your megastar shows up. So globalization of reggae, in the end, is always gonna help the creator of reggae, which is y'all. You seem to be on the verge, or, or about to break into mainstream, USA, which is a question that, that I have. If, if America is now ready for you and your, your message and your reggae, yeah. or reggae yeah. in general, yeah, yeah. What, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, I, you never know what's gonna break on the radio. I'm so bad at, at calling that, you know? Welcome mm -hmm. to Jamrock was played on every station for a year. Okay. You know, No Letting Go was, was that Wayne Wonder? Mm -hmm. No letting go now, holding back. That was on every pop radio station for, for six months. So I don't really know if anything I do is gonna break on the radio. I mean, I sing about a lot of heavy stuff, and heavy stuff's normally not what the radio is wants to play. <laughs> um, I think we are more of the, the people's chant, you know? Mm -hmm. Maybe radio's gonna play me one day, and if they do, great. You're growing, Jacob. You, you're exploding, some would say. And when one looks at where you were, um, say five years ago, in relation to where you are now, you're, you're, you're enjoying 16, 20 million hits on, on some of your videos sure. uh, on YouTube. Sure. I mean, there's no reggae, reggae artist out there who's... In fact, these are mainstream numbers, some will say. Sure. Um, I mean, we... Well, it depends on what market you're talking about. Mm -hmm. You know? I'm looking at... Um, but I compare you with other reggae artists. And I look at, um, at your numbers are appearing, uh, Big. are looking like pop numbers. Sure. In, in terms of fan base and people who are interested in your music, obviously. Um, so aren't you then, um, could be considered a, a mainstream, cut above the rest kind of reggae <laughs> artist? And, and are you, uh, is that what you want? Or would you want to look beside you uh, and see lots of other reggae soldiers. Yeah. Um, um, just soldiers. I yeah, think yeah, one yeah, of the, sure. <laughs> the terms you guys use in sure, one of your tracks. Sure. Um, beside you. Absolutely. When, when Bob Marley opened the door, he got a lot of people through that door with him. And the world realized there was more to reggae than Bob Marley. I'm not saying we're going to do what Bob Marley did. I think his, his sons have already done a lot of that. Um, but to answer your question of what I want, what I really want is for, I believe in the, in the words I say when I'm up there. I believe that the earth is in trouble. I feel like the human race is, is living their lives backwards. Um, I think in a lot of ways we were a lot smarter a couple hundred years ago than, than we are now. We lived in a way that was sustainable. Mm -hmm. Now it's all about consumption. It's not about preservation. It's not about longevity. It's about how much can I get? How fast can I get it? Uh, so the more, and I'm guilty of that myself, so the more my message gets out, the more I feel like the world has somebody out there saying, hey, um, and that's what I want. That's what makes me happy is to know that that message is getting out there because I believe in it. But as far as fame and money and stuff go, I couldn't care less at all. Yes, talk about that because you're the son of a uh, financial guru, some would say. <laughs> um, your father was, uh, was a, uh, an IMF representative to sure. Africa. Sure. And um, that, that's, that's a, it's a an big, institution it's a Jamaicans title. are yeah, very yeah. familiar with, <laughs> yeah, yeah. the IMF. Yeah. There are lots of ambivalence about the IMF I believe, in Jamaica. I'm sure, I'm sure. And you're the son of uh, an IMF executive. Absolutely. Um, what made you sound so radical in, in relation to your, your, your dad? Well, the thing is, he was, he was radical. Uh, he went over there and, and he was... Uh, 
He was a guy, it was his job to make sure that um, the money this loan Liberia was taking from the United States didn't go into the wrong hands. And Liberia, the story of Liberia is it's, it's where James Monroe, one of the U.S. presidents, mm -hmm. sent slaves back to be repatriated. Right? He named the capital Monrovia, James Monrovia, right? And he named the place Liberia, Liberty. But you can't just go in a place and create a country and say blah, blah, blah. So all the guys who were coming back from the States took over everything. So it's like 99% of the country is Liberians from there, and 1% is these guys who came back from the United States and took over everything because they had already learned how to do it. So it's a crazy place, and he was supposed to make sure the loan went to the true guy. And the guy got voted in 99 to 1. I mean, we were there when it happened. We lived across the street. This was not a bad neighborhood, you know, the palace is right there. And, uh, but the ex-American guy had already paid off, Samuel Doe had already paid off the military. So the military comes in, cuts the guy's head off, and uh, the war starts. So my dad kind of failed. And what he was supposed to be doing was improving yes. the dollars. And the guy, after my dad, went back there, printed a bunch of money, the IMF guy, so that they could pay the loan back. Oh. He just told them to turn the printers on. Paid us back. They said, great job. And Liberia's economy went, you can't just go print a bunch of money. You're finished. So my dad was pretty radical in his way of doing things. He really wanted to change the world when he was there. And, uh, and there came a time for him when he didn't like the direction of things. But he, he with me, I mean, he wrote a lot of these songs. Oh, that's what I was about to ask you. With How me, much does he support you? We would sit, we, we, we sit together at lunch and I have a piece of paper and I ask him questions. Oh. And I say, how does the U.S. Congress work? And he says, well, ever since George W. Bush, they are allowed to accept bribes and they don't have to report them. So your congressman is the go-between between you and your president, right? Mm -hmm. You want to talk to Obama, you got to go talk to your congressman. Now imagine in front of you is a guy, his shirt says Exxon, and he's got two billion in his briefcase. Mm -hmm. Behind you says Northrop Grumman or Halliburton. He's got 45 million in his briefcase. You're all waiting in line to talk to the same congressman. You got five dollars in your pocket. The congressman is supposed to represent you equally. Do you think that's gonna happen? So he would tell me that, and then I write that, and I get an idea for a song, I do some research. And there's a song, so he helps me write a lot of this, a lot of this stuff. He's pretty radical himself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so he's really behind you and with, your, with your music. He's, he, a, he's, a, he's, he's a, a huge, huge fan. He thinks the world is, is backwards, and I, I agree with him. I think that way too. What does Rastafari mean to you? When I was a child, I was very religious. Uh, not a little child, but when I was a teenager, I was finding myself and I needed a way to go. And it was great for me then, because it helped me find answers to questions. But as, yeah, I had all the answers when I was a kid, you know. Yeah. But uh, as I got older, every year, a little bit more, the questions start coming back. Mm -hmm. And for me, life turned into a thing where it was more about finding the answers than having them told to me. So right now, I wouldn't say I really have a religion. I just got a lot of spirituality and a lot of questions. And my mm -hmm. eyes are wide open. But Rastafari was, was key. I told you we'd go to the Bingy House every Saturday. I mean, yeah. for real, there's a yeah. real Bingy House in DC. Absolutely. And it was formative in who we are. I mean, we kept the same name. Soja originally meant Soldiers of Jah Army. Mm -hmm. We kept the name because of That's how- That's the name I was trying to remember. Yeah, yeah, Soldiers <laughs> of Jah Army. Well, because of, how, because of what it helped us to become and what it helped us to see. I mean, the whole idea of equal rights and justice for all, that comes from that movement, you know? Yeah but from the other angle, from the African angle, the Jamaican angle. Some hear you talk, they, they think you're African. Um, <laughs> where's race in your music, in your, in your thoughts? Um, how do you see race, the, the question of race? I think it's something that all cultures have a right to their own culture, and that's fine, you know? Jamaicans have dibs on reggae, you know? Yes. Americans have dibs on, on hip hop. You know, I mean, it, your culture is your culture, you know. Um, we're here in Puerto Rico. They have their culture, and that's a beautiful thing. People should never let that go away. It's beautiful. It should be held up. Traditions were meant to be passed on, 
you know, they teach us about who we are. Mm -hmm. It's a way to teach the next generation the things that the generation before has learned. But that being said, this whole idea of different races is stupid. I, I mean, if you want to have kids within your own race, that's fine. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But the idea of competition existing between us over different colored skin mm -hmm. is, is going gonna, is gonna to kill every one of us. And I, I, I see it every day in every war we fight. You know, guys from Virginia don't go over to California with a bunch of tanks and blow them up because they just, they, they look like them. They wouldn't do that to them. Okay. I think it's ruining the world. I think religion and race and these separatist ideas, I mean, every, every idea like that, any human rights thing, you know, whether it's homosexuals or, or whites and blacks or Jews and Christians or uh, tall people and short people or fat people and skinny people. I think any kind of division based on who a person is is, is what's going to be the death of the human race for sure. What are some of the, I, what I would call the unfinished business of the band? I'm trying to be like a newspaper. That's what I think Bob Marley was for me. And that's what I'm trying to be for whoever listens to my stuff. I want to continuously... Creating life? I just want to bring up some stuff that they don't show you on Fox News, that they don't show you on, on CNN, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm trying to bring up the stuff that I think really matters. And the way music is today, I mean, you don't need to be on MTV or be on the radio to, to have a following. All you need to do is talk about things or, or sing about things that people are concerned with. I want to keep doing that. Where's Jamaica on that agenda, on your agenda? For Jamaica's just starting to come up right now. Yes. Jamaica's never come up before. Mm -hmm. But I think we made a big enough wave now that it got across the ocean and now people are maybe talking a little bit about it. We would love to play in Jamaica. We've been saving that. Because okay. that was everything to us. I mean, the first 10 years of my life was centered entirely around, the first 10 years of my, you know, 13 and on, was centered entirely around Jamaica. And, I mean, I could probably, you know, find 56 Hope Road without a map, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've never been there. I know all that stuff, man. I know the producers, I know the studios, I know the streets, I know where people hang out, I know where the dancers Jacob, are. Jacob, I'm amazed at how... I've never been there. How much you know about Jamaica and the music? You like, you know every record. It, it, nah, I know the singles, man. <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, man. But we, that was, that was who made us what we were, yeah. is listening to this revolutionary music about changing the world. And we couldn't believe it, it came from this tiny little place. And we became, I mean, that's how we named the, the band, Soldiers of Jah Army. We call it Soldier now because we don't want to tell people what religion is right or what path okay. is right, you know. We want people to find that for themselves mm -hmm. so that it matters for them. If I tell you, the God looks like this, and you meet him one day, or her, and she looks completely different, you'll never believe a word I say again. I can't really tell you something I don't know the answer to, so we shortened it to soja, because, but we wanted to keep the roots because the roots meant so much to us. But Jamaica, I mean, that made us who we were. And you, you've worked with some Jamaican artists. Talk about Absolutely. some of them that you've worked with. Um, I can't Roots even, I underground. there's of course, there's too many to name at this point. Anytime we get the opportunity to work with a Jamaican artist, we jump on it because, and uh, I mean, it's, we, we did a CD called Surma Bear, which had two songs remixed like 14 times. And we had a lot of Jamaican artists on it. And we did it just for us, you know, mm -hmm. and it was just something we always wanted to do. But the big, the hardcore Soja fans all have that record and they all know this. I mean, it's like Tony Rebel, Sister Carol, Queen Africa, Luciano, all our favorite guys, you know. We can't wait, you know, we're very excited. We want to come to Rebel Salute. Okay. We've always heard that that's like the place for us. Uh, yes, it is. Definitely. Yeah. That? Somebody told me to come to Sting. I was like, I don't know. No. <laughs> I think somebody's going to throw a bottle I don't think at so, me. <laughs> no. Rebel Salute is the place for That's you. where we want to go rock out, you know, and, and, and do our thing there. Just play for 20 minutes, give people a taste it of it. It would be great to see you guys in Jamaica. And then just go yeah, hang yeah. out at the merchandise table for two days, you know? Yeah. That's our plan anyway. Absolutely. We'll get there. We're on the way. Hey, and on stage is going to help us get there, so I got to thank you. Oh, absolutely. Much. And then thank you, sir, <laughs> for having us. Well, I don't want to today and there you have them american soldier in reggae 
And that's our show for this week. Winford Williams, on behalf of all of us, thanking you for joining us. Do join us again next week for more On Stage. Thanks for watching our video. Please click subscribe and be on our stage anywhere, anytime, always.